So welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a, a good lunchtime and made lots of uh, connections and uh, got to know your, your fellow researchers. So let's continue with session number two. We have three more papers, actually, that are mortgage market related. So I'm really happy that we have so much interest and so many research papers on that topic because it's really important for central banks because, yeah, well, the mortgage market is hugely, hugely important from a financial stability perspective. So let me briefly introduce the three speakers that we have in our lightning session. So lightning session, it's the first time I, time I hear this term. So lightning session means it's relatively short presentations, 15 minutes, and then we don't have a discussion and the Q&A, but we just move on. So it's really the possibility to get in um, a number of papers still, and, um, and I hope you can all appreciate that. And then please use again the the coffee break uh, to follow up with questions. So the speakers are in, in this order. First of all, Stelios Giannoulakis from Athens University, and um, he is doing research on firm dynamics and macroeconomics, and he has already been at the ECB, actually, a couple of um, uh, years back as a trainee. And uh, the second speaker will be Jaunios Carmelavicius from the IMF, where he is financial sector expert, and his research interests are around banking, financial stability, and macroprudential policies. And then last but not least, Klaas Backman, who is um, working at the Department of Economics and Business Economics at Aarhus University, and will very soon join the SAFE here at Frankfurt University. So you have actually both uh, affiliations almost, and he has a strong research uh, portfolio related to mortgage markets. So I would give the floor to you, Stelius. You can go over there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I know that uh, it's difficult to present after the lunch, but I will do my best. Uh, let me say that uh, this is a joint work uh, with uh, Eugene Tereanu and uh, Marco Forletta from the ECB and uh, with uh, Marco Gross from the International Monetary Fund. The main theme we are addressing uh, in this paper is how borrower-based borrow bank credential policy measures can uh, improve the resilience of both households and banks. Uh, let me start with a few words about the motivation of the study. During the last decade, uh, borrow-based measures have been increasingly implemented uh, across the European Union. Of course, the eruption of the pandemic crisis uh, has slowed down their implementation both within and across the European countries. Uh, however, in the light of the recovery from the, re the recession, borrow-based measures have been called again upon to address the build-up of, vul of vulnerabilities in real estate markets. And indeed, many European countries started to tighten their borrow-based measures in 2022. Uh, moreover, in the context of the review of the European Macroprudential macro Framework by the European Commission, both uh, ECB and uh, the European System Credit Board uh, has underlined the need for a harmonized definition of lending standards. Uh, the risk board uh, took further by uh, suggesting the direct inclusion of borrower-based uh, borrower uh, measures in the policy toolkit of the European Union. So what we do in this study is to uh, contribute into the literature by developing a quantitative tool uh, for uh, assessing the role of borrower-based measures, first in enhancing household resilience, and with the term resilience we mean lower probabilities of defaults and losses given default. A key advantage of our paper is that uh, it takes into account the side effect of uh, borrow-based measures, which is nothing else than a reduction in the mortgage loans volumes. Second, our model can uh, evaluate the role of borrow-based borrow -based measures uh, in improving uh, bank's capital ratios through, uh, through the improvement of uh, their mortgage portfolios. Finally, we can use our model to analyze uh, the policy heterogeneity of borrow-based measures across the income and wealth distributions of households. Okay, I can skip this to save some time. Now, which are uh, the key messages of our study? We find that the implementation of borrow-based measures, and specifically their joint implementation, uh, can notably improve the resilience of households. Second, we find that uh, borrow-based measures uh, can improve capital ratios of banks 
through the improvement of their mortgage portfolios. The lower probabilities of defaults and losses given defaults of households improve the mortgage portfolios of banks and through them their capital ratios. Finally, we found that the resilience benefits of uh, borrow-based measures for households is more profound for low-income and low-wealth households. Let me move to the mechanics of our model. Our model has uh, three modules. A microeconomic module that helps us to describe the macroeconomic condition of each country. A micro module uh, uh, that helps us to quantify the improvement of, of households risk metrics after the implementation of borrow-based measures. And a bank impact module that helps us to see how borrow, the implementation of borrow-based measures can improve the capital ratios of banks. Let me start with the macroeconomic module. It's a six-variable structural var. Uh, you can see the six uh, variables he here. The most important of them uh, is unemployment, house prices, and credit to the private sector. Uh, the macroeconomic module, the structural var model, serves two goals. First, it helps us to, to, uh, uh, to stimulate a, a bunch of forward paths for these six macroeconomic variables. And second, by using sign restrictions, we can obtain the impulse responses of these six variables to a credit shock. We will use these uh, impulse responses of uh, these variables to quantify the adverse effect of borrow-based measures, which is nothing else than a reduction in mortgage loans. Let's move now to the microeconomic module. It has two parts. The first, the, the first part is an employment status simulator that gives us a bunch of forward paths for the employment status of household members. Uh, we obtain these uh, forward paths in a way uh, to match the uh, aggregate unemployment rate from the structural VAR. The second part of the microeconomic module is a household balancing simulator. Uh, this uh, simulator takes as an input the outputs of the previous uh, uh, modules and quantify the probabilities of defaults and losses given defaults for each household. Also, uh, how, it, uh, how we, we work on it, we, uh, we try to detect default, sen uh, default scenarios and default events for households. Uh, the, default, uh, the default criterion we use is negative financial assets. Now, the negative financial assets of households depend on macroeconomic conditions. Recall that we have a bunch of forward paths for macroeconomic variables, and thus a bunch of different macroeconomic scenarios. This means that we have a bunch of different default scenarios for households. Since we have many scenarios, default scenarios for households, we can define the probability of default. And given that, we can define losses given default. The last module of our model is the bank IBAC module. What the, this module does, uh, it attaches the improved probabilities of default and losses given default or the mortgage portfolios of banks. Uh, so we have a lower a, a unexpected loan losses, mortgage loan losses for banks and lower risk weighted assets. This means that we have better capital ratios. Very briefly, let me say a few words about the transmission of borrow-based measures in uh, our model. It's, it is a two-step mechanism. First, we both the regularity limits on the three borrow-based measures we are examining here, the loan-to-value ratio, the debt-service-to-income ratio, and the debt-to-income ratio. These regularity limits can be either individual or joint, a combination of the three borrow-based measures. And uh, we both these regularity limits under the baseline macro scenario as it formed by the structural of our model of the macroeconomic module. Uh, these regularity limits restrict new high-risk lending, re reducing the number of default episodes for households, and thus leading to lower probabilities of default and losses given default. However, as I said earlier, borrow-based measures have an adverse negative effect, uh, which is nothing else than a policy-induced reduction in mortgage loans, in mortgage loan volumes. Uh, our models quantify this policy, this policy induced uh, reduction and scale it using the, the impact responses from the MAC module, as I said in the previous slide. Now, this, the quantified side effect is fed back into the microeconomic module of our model, adapting the macroeconomic conditions. The deterioration of the macroeconomic conditions affect the financial assets of households, leading to more to a higher number 
of default episodes. Since we have a higher number of default episodes, we have a higher probability of default, and given that, higher losses given default. Of course, as we will see in the next slide, this side effect of borrower-based measures is not quantitative, quantitatively sufficient to cancel out the resilience benefits from uh, uh, borrower-based measures. Very briefly, a few words about the data. Our model combines microeconomic data from the household finance consumption survey with macro and bank-related data for, uh, from several sources. You can see some of them here. Okay, I will skip this to save some time. Let's move very fast to the results. This figure here summarizes the baseline uh, results of our model. The left figure uh, illustrates the distribution of country specific probability of defaults. Uh, uh, let me say that uh, we uh, simulated our model for, for 19 European countries. So here you can see this 19, the simulated 19 probability, the distribution of this 19 probabilities of defaults. We, uh, we run four scenarios. The first scenario, it is the green bar, bar, uh, bar here, is a scenario with a no policy scenario without the implementation of borrow-based measures. There are three other, four other scenarios, one with the implementation of each borrow-based measure separately, and one, the last one, with the joint implementation of these measures. The right figure shows the, uh, the distribution of the country-specific losses given default. Two important points here. First, both income and collateral-based macroprudential policies improve the resilience of households in terms of lower probabilities of defaults and losses given default. Second, uh, the resilience benefits for households are much stronger when policy limits are uh, imposed jointly. Let me move to the results from the bank uh, uh, impact module. So, the reduced probabilities of default and losses given default improve the mortgage portfolios of banks, leading to lower expected losses and lower risk-weighted assets. And this, these two positive effects lead to higher capital ratios. The, the left figure here shows the change in capital ratios of the 19 countries, 19 European countries. Uh, the, it shows the change between the non-policy scenario and the scenario with a joint application of uh, borrow-based measures. As we can, as we can see here, the, the joint implementation of the measures has led to uh, an increase in one percentage point, uh, uh, approximately. The other two figures decompose this positive effect between the impact of the reduction in low, in low and losses and the impact of the uh, uh, fall in risk-weighted assets. As we can see, the 80% of the increase in the capital ratios is due to the fall in risk-weighted assets, while only the 20% of this positive effect is due to the reduction in mortgage loan losses. Now, let's move to the distributional effect of borrow-based measures. The left figure here shows the reduction in probabilities of defaults under the uh, in the scenario with a joint uh, implementation of uh, borrower-based measures relative to the non-policy scenario. We do this for uh, households with high and low income, namely for households above and below the median of the uh, income distribution of households. As we can see here, and in the right figure, we have the same, we have the distribution of the reductions in losses given default. As we can see, you can see here, the resilience benefits by, from the implementation of borrow-based measures is more profound for uh, uh, households with low income, and we have the same results even when we examine the wealth distribution. Uh, very briefly, let me summarize the main results of this paper. Again, we find that borrower-based measures can notably improve uh, the resilience of households, and especially where they are jointly applied. We also find that uh, borrower-based measures can support bank solvency ratios through their improvement of their mortgage portfolios. And finally, we find that the, the resilience benefits are most important for households with low income and low wealth. Thank you. Thanks very much, Celios.
also for superb timekeeping. So, uh, Jan, yes, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Today, I would like to present you a joint paper with my uh, colleague, Mantas Derma. Uh, and the paper is titled Microassessment of Macroprudential Borrower-Based Measures in Lithuania, which is basically sharing of our experience in calibrating the BBMs using uh, micro data. Uh, how do I? Okay, the usual disclaimer applies. I'm gonna provide you some background, uh, overview of the methodology, which gives an assessment of BBMs and lay ground for conclusions. So uh, Lithuania adopted macroprudential borrower-based measures uh, back in 2011 through the enactment of responsible lending regulations, which we call ASN as per Lithuanian acronym. And the package as a whole consists of five measures that include the LTV of 85%, DSTI of 40, stress DSTI of 50%, uh, you have a maturity limit of 30 years, and you have a newest piece of regulation, the LTV for secondary mortgages, which was issued back in 2022 and it stands at 70%. A mortgage loan is said to be secondary if during its inception, the household has at least one other active housing loan. And the package was aimed primarily to boost resilience and then desirably can also act uh, counter cyclically. However, during the low rate environment, we were facing a couple of issues. First off, there was a, a really hot housing market in Lithuania, one of the hottest in, in the European Union, which kind of culminated in a mortgage credit overflow measured at 15%. We had a house price ever, overvaluation of 20%. Of so a natural question may arise, how is it that we have had macroprudential policy for a e decade, and yet we are still facing these vulnerabilities? So it may be that the BBM framework as a whole is not effective in in uh, putting a backstop to this excessive growth or either the BBM uh, parameterization is not stringent enough. The other, the other issue we were facing is, uh, was the increasing prevalence of secondary mortgages, which we found out that do default more often. They often have uh, higher DSTI ratios and surprisingly they have high LTVs, which are concentrated around 80%, just below the 85% uh, headlight limit. And as a bonus to that, they add additional fuel to the already hot, hot housing market. Um, what we do in this paper, we try to address three questions about the efficacy of the BBM package in containing credit risk, uh, about the limits, their parameterization, is it adequate, and what is the necessary regulation for secondary mortgages in terms of LTV. And to do so, we develop a complete credit risk framework that models expected credit lifetime losses. Uh, which use PD, LGD models that are all based on micro data. So let me turn briefly to the methodology. The data is from the household credit register, which is combined with household income data spanning from 2004 to 2020. And for credit risk assessment, we model loan level default offense and credit risk defi is defined as the expected credit loss that is equal to the PD times LGD where the latter two parameters are modeled, uh, modeled separately in a one year ahead framework. Particularly PD is modeled as a simple logistic regression where we regress household default dummies on household loan characteristics, macro variables, and importantly, BBM related variables that are measured at loan origination at the point when BBM limits can really control uh, household leverage. And they enter the equation non-linearly using a cubic spline specification. What is more, the LGD is computed using a simple accounting rule that is based on loan parameters and amortization schedule features because we don't really uh, observe loan by loan uh, losses. Uh, I'm not going into the detail about the PD model results, but all coefficient signs are as expected. Uh, they are highly statistically significant, and the model's discriminatory power in terms of OROC statistic that is measured out of sample uh, stands at 90%, which is pretty high. Um, 
instead of merely looking at one year PDs and uh, one year LGDs, we want to evaluate a lifetime's worth of credit risk, credit risk for each loan. And to this end, we uh, compute the expected lifetime credit loss that is based on each loan's amortization schedule and the evaluated PD LGD parameters that also vary throughout its life cycle. We will be using this methodology to assess BBMs. And the first question at hand is the efficacy of the BBM package as a whole. And to shed light on that issue, we are displaying these charts, which show the distributional characteristics of factual LTV, DSTI, and maturities throughout 2005 to 2020 for actually uh, for, for loans that originated in the period. So preceding the GFC, we, we see a little bit of uh, risk taking that uh, elevated along with elevated LTVs, DSTIs and maturities. Uh, Post GFC period saw uh, market self correction, thus the introduction of ASN requirements wasn't really distortionary at the time. However, current BBM framework still ensures that the market uh, mortgage risk parameters are constrained and, and don't really go over the top. We, we used our modeling framework to uh, simulate the historical lifetime PDs and lifetime expected credit loss rates that are measured at loan origination. And from what you can see, the credit risk now is much smaller compared to the pre-regulatory era. What is more, we did this counterfactual experiment where, uh, where we saw that during the crisis of 2009, mortgage losses would have been 83% smaller had ASN regulation been present uh, in the 2000s preceding the GFC. And lastly, we did this sensitivity test where we introduced a drop in household income and an increase in interest rate. And the test really reveals that households are now much more resilient to stress than in the pre-regulatory era. So let me turn to the adequacy of BBM limits and more particularly uh, the parameterization. Together with my colleague Mantas, we were thinking about the options uh, for, for tightening had authorities decided to lean against the wind during the low rate era. And a natural starting point to, uh, to look at that is to look at the distributional characteristics of how binding the measures are. And we concluded that LTV is not uh, really an option for binding, uh, tightening because it's already binding for too many people, especially young families who have often have good collateral. And the measure is quite stringent from EU perspective. Therefore, we shifted our attention to DSCI since any binding of a DSCI measure would be less impactful, but also less distortionary for the market and more risk targeted. However, it's not clear what is the right DSTI cap from risk perspective. And to shed light on this matter, we computed our model based marginal effects. That is, what is the marginal impact of a change in DSTI on the probability of default at each different level of DSTI? And we mapped this relationship, which resulted in these beautiful bell shaped curves, which have a strong peak maximum which is basically saying that the probability of default is growing at the maximum possible uh, rate at this point of DSTI. So if you were the regulator, you wouldn't, definitely you wouldn't want to find yourself in such a situation at this fast growing PD you would want to be to the left of that curve. However, if you take a look at the ASN requirements in Lithuania, they're already beyond this point to the right, suggesting that during the low rate environment, Lithuania's DSTI limits were on the loose end. Suppose the regulator decided to tighten this measure uh, to, rec to correct this, uh, how would households behave? How households would definitely try to lengthen uh, their loan maturities to uh, minimize their loan payments to keep up with the new DSTI uh, uh, requirements. However, the model really shows that longs with long maturities are more likely to default over their long lifespans. Thus, we thought that the DSTI cap should be set in conjunction with the maturity limit. I'm not going to describe into the detail uh, this chart, but suppose there was a situation where the authorities tried to lean against the wind and close the 15% credit gap. They would be exploring multiple op options of, of, of uh, reducing DSTI and maturity limits. However, the model is basically saying that if you want to 
min uh, close the credit gap and at the same time minimize a lifetime credit risk, the first best option is to do a joint reduction in DSTI and maturity limits to counter the feature that uh, households would try to shift their maturities, prolong their maturities uh, as a result of re uh, reduction in uh, DSTI limit. Um, okay, and going back to the issue of, of secondary mortgages, uh, the model is really showing that secondary mortgages are more likely to default compared to an otherwise identical but single loan. So this is an issue, but we can really fix that as a regulator because if the PD of a secondary loan is high, we can counterbalance with a strict LTV limit so that the LGD is lower and the expected credit loss is pretty much uh, balanced. However, there is a bigger problem in terms of secondary mortgages because mere issuance of them imposes a negative externality of heightened default risk for existing housing loans that are already out there in the portfolio and you can't really affect them because you can't affect as uh, you can't uh, issue ex post regulation so to counter that you would want to tighten the ltv limit even more so to to counterbalance the first and the second effects that i have just described so how to do so, we did this calibration exercise with Mantas where we tried to find a personalized LT secondary LTV limit for every mortgage that was issued in the history. And how, we, how did we do it? We, we, uh, we were looking uh, for a secondary mortgage limit that would solve this equation in, uh, and equalize the credit risk of a household having two mortgages with the very same household having one mortgage but with uh maximal attainable asn limits and as a result we have this chart which basically says that all secondary mortgages should have a ltv limit that is strictly lower than the headline ltv limit of 85 percent there is a negative relationship between first mortgages current ltv and secondary mortgages uh calibrated ltv limit and the relationship is a bit of a kinked around the 70% first mortgage threshold, basically saying that if a household has a first loan that is relatively unamortized or high LTV, then he or she cannot be issued a loan which with a very relatively high LTV. So that is what actually the Bank of Lithuania implemented back in 2022, uh, imposing the 70% limit on, on secondary loans. And it's also differentiated by, by the first loan's uh, current LTV limit. So let me, uh, let me jump back to the conclusions. In, in, in terms, by limiting mortgage DSCI, LTV, and maturity parameters, which all affect credit risk, the BBM toolkit can be effective in containing credit risk. And as we saw from our stress test results, borrowers are now more resilient to stress than the, in the pre-regulatory era. Uh, what is more, during the low rate period, according to our nonlinear model, the DSTI measures were on the loose end. Uh, so if you want to achieve credit reduction targets uh, at the same time minimize lifetime risk, the best, uh, the best uh, combination would be, the best move would be to uh, combine a joint tightening of DSTI and maturity limits. And as per secondary mortgages, not only they are riskier, but they also impose negative externalities on other loans, uh, thus they rightly are and should remain uh, regulated by imposing a more stringent cap. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Janus. And then we have Klaas as a final speaker. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Swedish macro prudential policy, a policy known as the amortization requirement that basically mandated that mortgages with an LTV ratio above 50% has to be amortized, that is, repaid. So in practice, this, this reform uh, banned interest-only mortgages for, for high LTV loans. So. Um, this paper is joined with Patrick Moran, who's at the Fed board, and Peter van Santen, who's at the University of Groningen. Uh, and the usual disclaimer is applied because Pat is at the Fed board. Um, 
Okay, so to kind of motivate this, we're going to note that one of the most important features of the mortgage contract is the uh, repayment schedule. So deciding how fast you are going to repay the debt. So the repayment schedule introduces mandatory mortgage repayments, um, mandatory savings that is designed to build home equity over time. This is one of the largest savings plans in the world. So there is some data from the United States and that Bernstein and Kuji's paper saying it's about $300 billion a year going into mortgage amortization. If we take a policy perspective on this, we can, I'm sure you all know that there's an active debate in many countries over whether to prohibit interest only mortgages or um, to further regulate mortgage design. So financial innovation has meant that there are new products coming up that in a lot of respects tend to target the repayment plan. So in the United States, the most famous example is the interest only mortgage that was very popular in the pre-financial crisis that was later removed with the Dodd-Frank Act, or de facto ban. In Europe, a lot of regulators are looking at banning interest-only mortgages, or at least regulating this part of the, of the mortgage contract. Now, our research question here is going to be, what's the impact of these kind of policies on household borrowing? And we're going to be specifically looking at borrowing at origination. Um, and what we're going to do in the paper is we're going to exploit this reform that you already saw on the first slide um, that eliminated interest-only bor interest mortgages for borrowers with an LTV ratio above 50%. Um, as you saw, we're going to document substantial bunching below the threshold, meaning that households are voluntarily lowering their loan-to-value ratios in order to achieve you know, to, to get rid of amortization payments. Our results are that this is driven by, by wealthy households. Uh, we've, we don't find any evidence of credit constraint there. In fact, only 14% of the households who are placing themselves at this threshold are doing so because of credit constraints. Um, and we don't find any other supply side factors that could explain this. Most prominently, there's no changes in the interest rate terms. Um, so that's on the empirical side. Uh, we want to, or we're interested a little bit in the mechanisms behind this. So why are wealthy households so keen on getting an interest-only mortgage? Um, and to do that, we're going to put up a life cycle model of, of uh, well, with long-term mortgages. And we find that in the baseline model, there is no bunching. Households have a number of ways to undo required amortization payments. That means that this kind of policy is just not costly for them. They don't respond in the way that we see in the data. So we put in some, some more behavioral features in the contract, uh, in the preferences, and we're going to argue that the bunching is driven by households experiencing what we call flow disutility amortization payments. Essentially, you can think of this as they think that amortization payments are a cost, an interest rate. That's the pattern that's... Uh, most consistent with our data. And the implication of this is that interest-only mortgages may substantially increase aggregate household debt because households are not taking this, um, it's the true cost of the mortgage into account. Okay, uh, a little background on the policy and the institutional setting. So you can think of Swedish mortgages as essentially a bank loan with no set maturity where you kind of pay the interest and in amortization. Um, most mortgages are, are adjustable rate with no set maturity. And that's the kind of bank loan part of it. Pre-reform, a majority of contracts were interest only. So Swedish borrowers typically don't tend to pay back their, their loans. Uh, they tend to save in other assets, but that, that's another discussion. Uh, Sweden, like many countries, experienced high debt levels and rising debt levels, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And, you know, there was more attention to household debt following this. So the regulator decided that this was a threat to macroeconomic stability and they wanted to do something about it. Their policy was uh, to essentially say that if you have 
high LTV mortgages, you're going to have to pay back on the principal. And the idea was to kind of reduce debt over time, right? Force people to amortize their debt. Um, the thing that we're going to be looking at is this 50 threshold where essentially interest only mortgages were prohibited. It's also important to note that uh, after you cross this threshold, you can turn off amortization payments again. So if you start at 51, you amortize down to 50, you can call the bank and they'll, they'll stop taking money from your account. Now, the empirics is uh, it's nice to present because it's essentially in graph form. Uh, the, the intuition behind this is that the design of the policy where I should say the amortization payment is the amortization requirement is it's 1% of the entire mortgage, right? So there's a big discontinuous jump right at the threshold. Uh, but the design of this requirement creates a trade-off where if you are close to this threshold, you can choose between having a larger down payment or lower amortization payments. Um, and this is going to allow us to identify the response of borrowers to changes in, this, um, in, in payments. For example, let's say that you want to borrow against a $500,000 house. If you pick a down payment of $250,000, you have an LTV of 50% and you don't have to make any amortization payments. If you pick a down payment of $240,000, your LTV is 52% and you have to amortize $200 a month. It's a very salient choice for households sitting at the bank deciding how much money am I going to put in. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the empirics in the paper, uh, as you can imagine. I'll note that the policy had bite, as in there are very few interest-only mortgages just to the right of the threshold after the reform. Right? So the upper uh, graphs there are 2013, 14, 15 pre-requirement, about 60% of contracts, 50, 60% of contracts were interest only. After the reform, to the right of the threshold, there, there are no interest only contracts. Uh, empirically, we see that we take that graph that we had on the very first slide and we essentially just collapse that down and then we can uh, elicit some, some behavior by households. So we find that 8% of borrowers within this kind of region, they bunch, so they place themselves at the point where they minimize amortization payments. Uh, they reduce their loan to value ratio by 5%, two and a half percentage points over 50, so 5%. Uh, we find little missing mass, which we're gonna use later in the model part. Um, and we find that 86% of these borrowers do not face any binding credit constraints. So, First of all, they have 50% equity in their house, right? So they're, they're fairly wealthy on that side. They also don't face any payment constraints or binding payment constraints. And we don't find any other evidence for supply side factors that could explain this. So most importantly, no changes in the interest rate around this threshold. Um, so, we want to explain this, or, or the referees want us to explain this. Uh, uh, <laughs> they're, they're right, so uh, we should think a little bit more about this. It is a little bit of a puzzling result. Um, so what we're going to do is we're, we're going to construct a life cycle model of consumption, housing, and mortgages, where households are going to get utility from consumption and housing. There's going to be heterogeneity and risk in the model coming from initial uh, assets, initial income, and income risk. There's no house price risk in, in this model. I think we could add that. I don't think it would change much, but no house price risk. Uh, households are allowed to choose consumption, liquid assets, housing. So there's a rental market as well, um, and houses of different sizes. And they're allowed to choose, you know, they have long-term mortgage contracts. We're going to model the, the, the reform as a world with, where the mandatory minimum payments are interest only, uh, um, or the Swedish policy where you have to amortize 1% of the, of the mortgage um, if you have a LTV ratio above 50. And you can also do cash out refinancing. Um, the result in the baseline model is that there is no bunching below the threshold. Um, so this is the LTV distribution. 
from the model, and then we just plot the fraction of errors within each bin. The reason this happens in the model is that there is no kink or notch in expected discounted utility. So what that means is, you, or what you can see in the graph is that the baseline model is in blue. Uh, the interest only model is in orange, a little bit above. So it's above households like to live in an interest only world, but they have a number of different ways to undo required amortization payments. They can do refinancing, they can do borrowing more, they can change their other savings. So this doesn't have a discontinuous impact at this threshold in the model. Uh, so what's going on? Uh, we're going to put in two um, behavioral wedges and household preferences. This is motivated by us finding nothing in the budget constraint that could explain this, so no changes in interest rate. So if it's not in the, in the budget constraint, it has to be somewhere in preferences. Uh, and we're going to do two types of costs, one that is very local, so a one-off this utility that applies when borrowers turn off amortization. The easiest way to conceptualize this is a cost of calling the bank. Uh, the second is this ongoing flow, this utility to amortization. You can think of this as some kind of psychic cost, households uh, viewing amortization payments as a cost. Uh, and there is some literature that, that, that talks about this. What this does is the one-off cost is going to generate what's known as a notch in the bunching literature. So being right to the right of the threshold here is going to be, have, uh, is going to change this continuous change in this slope, right? So the change in the average rate. Uh, importantly, what happens is that households are going to bunch. Households who are just to the right of the threshold are going to say, I don't really want to pay this cost. I'm going to move my, my borrowing a little bit to the left so that I avoid this, this one-time cost. And then there's a region there that it's maybe may difficult to see with these colors, but there's a dominated region where no one wants to be. So there's an empty space there that's known as missing mass. The second one is going to generate a kink in expected utility. So that's a change in the slope, right? So everyone above the threshold who have to amortize have to pay this, one, this, this cost. It's an ongoing cost. Uh, that changes the, the slope of this line. And that's going to generate bunching, but everyone is going to kind of move down, right? So there's no missing mass. Uh, in the data, we find little missing mass above the threshold. Um, so this kind of makes us think that uh, flow this utility is more important. We also try to contact the banks and see what kind of cost there could be to refinancing, and they all kind of said that there's no cost to refinancing. It's enough to do a phone call or, or in the mobile app. Uh, the implication of this is that Households, if this is true, households are going to choose a mortgage contract that comes with a higher lifetime cost, essentially because they're confused. Um, and if you go the other way from this policy and you introduce interest-only mortgages, households are going to think that's really cheap. And so they're going to increase their borrowing by a lot, even though it's not actually cheap. Um, so to conclude, this is a very short talk, so maybe I don't need to reiterate these things again. Um, but we find that households reduce borrowing to avoid amortization payments. I'll note that if you're thinking about this from a macro potential perspective, and you're saying the amortization requirement reduced debt, having households with a 50% loan to value ratio who have a lot of income to support mortgage payments, maybe that's not the group that you were targeting. These are not high risk borrowers, I think. Um, um, and then we argue that most of the bunching comes from a kink in preferences. And uh, I'll note finally that overall impact on financial stability also depends on what you do with the money. So are you now more liquid because of this uh, with your savings behavior? So I don't think you can conclude that this uh, improved financial stability, although you know, in one dimension. But um, that's it. Thank you for, for listening and 
So thank you very much. That concludes session number two. We learned a lot about housing markets and how to apply macroprudential policies to these markets. And I think we got a lot of evidence, mainly based on national data. No, so but that's just in, in the nature of the of this matter, because we do have very different mortgage uh, markets and also very different behavior. I think of borrowers or or. Or, or households in, in general, and I think also data availability varies a, much, varies a lot, but I think we can still all learn from these papers and uh, to see, uh, yeah, where we have similar problems of overheated housing markets and we see what types of bore based measures may work and may not work and what are the effects and also the the impact the effect of uh, the importance of different household characteristics so i think that was very interesting and i'd like to thank the three presenters again and everyone else in this session